The following interview was conducted with Emily Mobley for the Purdue, Emily Mobley, the Esther Ellis Distinguished Professor of Library Science and former Dean of the Libraries for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, November the 21st, uh, 2007 at the TV studio in Stewart Center on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about your early years and education, high school. Wow, I'm not sure I can think back that far. <laughs> um, Where you were born? I grew, I was born in uh, Georgia, Valdosta, very small town, but I understand when I was six months old, we moved to Detroit, Michigan. And the Detroit area and the suburban Detroit was where I grew up in um, stayed, shall we say, in that area for many years, went to a small high school, and uh, from there to the University of Michigan. And to this day, I still have blue blood in my veins. It was only two years ago that I released my um, season's football tickets for the games. Uh -huh. Do you have any brothers or sisters and siblings? Uh, yes, I have uh, two sisters and one brother. Um, the next, the sister next to me is considerably younger than I am, about 13 years. And I told my mother she waited to have more when she had a built-in babysitter. <laughs> but uh, they are all, they have, I should say, um, I think they've all done well. Um, my sister closest to me is an associate dean at a university in Illinois. And uh, my brother uh, recently retired as a captain in the Coast Guard. And my youngest sister is uh, a nurse practitioner and uh, works. She's raising a family, so she does not work all the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud of their mm. successes also. Tell us a bit about what college was like. What was the, did you live on campus at the university? Uh, yes, I, uh, I loved it. I lived in the residence halls for uh, most of the time. I think in the summers, because uh, I went to school a couple of summers, and I did have apartments in the summer. And those were the days when women had to be in at 11 o'clock at night. There was no visitation, no cohabitation, and no co-ed dorms. So that was the real days of Parentis and Locus. Mm -hmm. Any clubs or student organizations that you were involved in? Uh, I college? was involved in my sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha, and as uh, I did become basilis or president uh, while I was there. So okay. I think that was the bulk of my uh, activities that I can remember at this point. It seems like there were a few other things, but I okay. played a lot of bridge. Okay. How about post-college? Any graduate studies? And then what did you do? And then your career path before you came to Purdue? Uh, I did all of my work at the University of Michigan, including uh, graduate work. And uh, did you ask about the jobs? No. Be, uh, what did you do with your career path after the graduate studies and prior to coming to Purdue? Okay. I actually started out as an elementary teacher. And one of the reasons is my father had this, I'll say, wonderful philosophy called, I will buy you all a bachelor's degree. Anything else, you'll have to pay for it on your own. I knew at, that, at the time that I graduated with the bachelor's that I wanted to be a librarian. So based on what my father said, I made sure that I had a degree I could use. And so I did teach for a year and went back to school, and then ended up at uh, Chrysler Corporation as an engineering information specialist, my first library job. Um, and um, from there, I went to Wayne State University. I don't know whatever possessed me to try academic librarianship, but I thought I wanted to try something different. And I did and found out I absolutely loved it. Um, so then I went back to school. And when I left 
the University of Michigan that time, I ended up at General Motors Research Labs. Um, well, because I guess I'd have to say they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I thought it was something that I really wanted to pursue. Uh, after about uh, three years there, the four years, I didn't feel my career was moving in the manner that I had anticipated. So then I went to General Motors Institute, which at that point was still under General Motors, but very soon became divested in mm -hmm. an independent institution. So as the, there I was the director uh, it was the first time I had a directorship. And once I had a taste of that, I guess, I thought, gee, it would be nice to be a director in one of those big places like Wayne State, for instance. So I, um, after a couple, after about three years, four years, I remember having a meeting with uh, Joe Dagnese. I had known Joseph. Uh, Joe Dagnese was the director of libraries here before me. He was my predecessor. And I said, Joe, what do I need to do to get a position like yours? That is what I'm interested in doing. And he guided me well. He said, you're not going to get to this kind of position from where you are. You're going to need to do a higher level job in an ARL library. And so I said, oh, yucky, uh, something like that. And he said, well, I'm afraid that's the way it has to be, the way it would be, you would uh, uh, be attractive at that point. And um, the other thing is he suggested that I needed to do that by a certain age. And I said, okay. I said, let me think about this. And he said, well, think about this also. I will probably have the type of job that you need within the next year to 18 months. I don't know how you feel working, with, how you would feel working for me, but think about all of that. And so I did think about it, uh, it kind of did some more research on what it would take, found out that uh, I think what he told me was quite accurate. So when the position here was open, I applied. And um, I was fortunate enough to get the position and had the pleasure of working with him for two and a half years before he unfortunately uh, died in mm -hmm. office. Yeah. And then I was appointed acting director and then dean. Right. Okay. And full professor. And this, you were the first dean of the Purdue Libraries. Uh, yes. And I might also add the first black dean in the history of Purdue University, right. which was a shock to me, considering that it was 1989. But nevertheless, I was. Okay. And now still, the, until last year, was the only one in the history. Right. Okay. How about some challenges at the start of the leadership? Um, you had you were, one of the couple of the goals that you had indicated were establish an archives, boost the library's percentage of the overall budget, develop a database information delivery systems, and your long range goals was to develop a major facility for the library that brings together more collections and access to materials and collections beyond Purdue libraries. These were some of the things that you shared at the initial. Mm -hmm. any comments on any some of these? <clears throat> Win some, lose some would be my comments. Okay. Um, actually, 
the library had a long way to go. When I first um, evaluated what was needed and I looked at where, if you want to say that the libraries had gone wrong in the past, the support, and I really will have to say that there was a lack of university support for the libraries. There is no way I can pretty that up. Uh, that was the problem. A ma let's say that was a major problem. Mm -hmm. Another major problem is that there was not a direction that the library was focused on going. It was sort of, in a way, like a, a, a ship not really anchored in the ocean, but uh, the anchor was up, so it was just kind of drifting. Um, also, there was, I will say, a bit of money there. The question was, was the money being spent uh, in the most efficient manner? I'm not going to use the word wisely because based on what goals there were, it was as wise as it could be. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at all of those things and I came up with these were all uh, needs, and you may gather that the, all of those needs had major, major dollar signs right. on them. Uh, so the strategic plan, which our planning that had started under Joe's leadership, on which I was the chair of those first efforts, uh, we had, I believe, done, completed the survey by the time um, I was appointed dean. So we had an idea on how our users felt. Uh, we needed to look inward and outward, which we did for a period of time. And when we completed our first strategic plan, I believe we did have ownership because we did that plan internally. We did not use an external consultant to actually work with the plan. Uh, from time to time, I think we had a retreat where we used an outside facilitator. But we actually did the plan. And so I believe because of that, we had the bulk of the library's faculty and staff on the same page. And I think the important thing of that plan, more than the outcome, what was important is that we became a sort of cohesive force. Okay. And we came out of this with an I can do. I believe, attitude, because there was a poor me attitude, and we'd been beaten down for years is the best way I could say it. Yeah. And so to get that spring to our step uh, was very important to facing this future where we were going to prove that we could be more than we had been. Yeah, good point. So when you go back to the, the question that you asked, um, it took a while to do that since we were doing it internally. Um, it was also very clear we couldn't fight all fronts on one at one time. So we focused initially on creating this library of the future, which did not matter it was in space, not in place. And um, we were not going to get a facility, a new facility, which would bring us all together, would cost a minimum of $50 million at that time. Um, on top of it, there was no buy-in from the faculty of the university who were used to having libraries in every corner, so to speak. Um, 
So that was not something, even though I will say it was run up the flagpole, uh, holes were shot in the flag very rapidly as expected. Um, so, and if you looked at archives at that time, although it was uh, very good to know your past, we needed to get to the future before we worried about our past. Right. Uh, and I certainly felt that based on what I saw was the tenor of the administration at that time, there would be a cachet with saying or with moving into this electronic world where we would be high tech and we would be like Purdue, futuristic high tech. Call that shot right. So. Okay. Well, that leads me to one of the big things was Thor Day. Yes. Uh, Thor Day. Thor Day. Thor Day. What was Thor Day? I, a way we used technology to put information was accessible from anywhere onto the student's desktop. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That was part of our, I will call it our marketing <laughs> message uh, for that. And Thor was another one of those um, events, that naming event, the naming of our library system as Thor, internal, again, more to build on staff cohesion, staff buy-in, and shall I say feel good to, to get us going because we were going to be embarking on an enormously hard bit of work. Um, and so Thor became our first system open to the public. Now, the library did have an internal automated system known as Pulse, I believe, at that time. And I will say that there was foresight there, uh, much foresight by, my, by the, our predecessors here to start years ago the process of putting all of our records into electronic form. Right. Even though it was not available to the public, we actually had an electronic catalog. We still were doing cards, of course, and filing cards, but nevertheless it was, um, all of our records were there. Also, the a serials uh, conversion project uh, meant that all of our serials records were in electronic form. Right. Now, this was something that we were very far ahead of the curve of most ARL libraries because so many of the large libraries started almost at ground zero and they had to go back and it took them years to convert their all of their records into electronic format and uh, serials. I'm not sure some of them have finished to this day on their serials holdings collections, but mm -hmm. I, I should hope so. But it, it's uh, certainly, I would say, five years ago, mm -hmm. they were not, some of the larger ones were not complete. Uh, so when we were able to get our first comprehensive system, which was developed uh, by, I think was Notice was the, the mm -hmm. vendor at that time. When we got that system, we were immediately able to convert all of our records into it. So when we came up into that system, and our system is Thor, the online resource, um, we had everything there. Mm -hmm. We are one and, leg up. and the other thing was our philosophy that information any place, uh, so to speak, uh, it meant that we had to have our system connected to what was the, if you want to call it, forerunner of the internet here. And that was an that was very interesting considering that the university was not wired. But we were able to pull it off and, and so 
people around campus could start seeing the power of our vision. And that is what propelled us to the next steps. Okay. So that's Thor Day, yeah, okay. Mm. <laughs> One of the things that uh, that Serials Cancellation Project, that took, that was quite a undertaking. The first one, the yeah. second one, or the... Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. That was kind of wrenching. And because Don Brown had appointed that ad hoc, ad hoc committee, you know, started when you were, when you were on board. And, uh, but you got it done. Well, yes, but it, it created a model that had not happened here. One of the concerns by upper administration was the um, shall we say how the faculty would feel and when I said that there was money I wasn't sure if it was being spent efficiently at that time we had four and five and six copies of the same journal and, I mean, I looked at that and I went, oh my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. And there would be, I mean, I'll take the case of the um, Life Sciences Library and at that time the Biochemistry Library, which was finally ceased to exist. They were across the parking lot from each other. The duplication was about 85, 90 percent. And we're, we're not talking cheap titles. We are talking the top of the line. But we also had five subscriptions to chemical abstracts. And I mean, now I, I say, and I mean, I felt that way then. But there was not a will to change. But the uh, publishers, gave us a will as the prices escalated and which led to this cancellation. I mean, we would get money every year, whatever it took to keep that up. I was pleased about that. The administration felt that the journals were our lifeblood. Now, what that meant is that liberal arts was crying and nipping at my heels all the time, I really wanted to say something else, but nipping at my heels was the best thing I could say because we never got any extra money for books, but all for our existing journals. No new, not new journals. We had to carve out new journals from old ones, and that's how we were able to get some du rid of some duplication early, earlier by doing that. But I kept looking at that money going down, and I'm thinking, boy, we could do a whole lot better if we were to do this differently. And we started having the vision, and the publishers weren't there yet, that one day all of this stuff was going to be at the desktop. We did not need all of these, all this paper sitting around in all of these places. Um, but anyway, the cost of it had gotten so much that the administration was saying, oh my goodness, what can I do? And I said, we need a conversation. We need to be honest with the faculty. I need to tell them exactly what's happening and what we need to do. Oh, no. Oh, God. No, 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 no. You don't want to do that. Oh, because they'll just be an up, out, you know. Oh, there'll be such a hue and cry and it's going to be just awful. This is what happened before. And I said, but you haven't done it this way. So I said, this is what I want. Don, appoint a committee. I want, these are the people, or the types of people that I want uh, from each school, representatives, and representative from the Senate, and on, just the right mix. So we started meeting, and 
our initial meeting, I explained to them what the problem was. And then I provided them with some figures that I knew would be quite shocking to them. And so, yes, that's exactly what happened. They went, what? I mean, our users did not know what their journals cost. And I felt that was a large part of the problem. And when they started looking at those prices and how many we're paying that much money, we have that many copies, I didn't have to say anything else. And he said, well, what will we do? And I threw out there, I said, it looks like we need about a half a million dollar serials cut. If we have that, then this is what is projected, uh, you know, how long will last and such and so forth. And of course, the first reaction was, oh, no. And, well, let's look at this. So, we met fortnightly, as I told them we would be meeting, and every bit of information they asked for, I provided it. I knew what they were trying to get out of this. But finally, I mean, they came to a consensus that there was nothing else we could do, and we had to do this. And so, essentially, it was their recommendation. And there was stunned silence, so to speak, in the upper administrative quarters. And then I said, I need to send out a letter to the whole faculty. Oh, oh, yes, telling them what we've been doing, what's going to happen, how they will be involved. Well, I, I will tell you then, I was not real happy with the um, reaction of certain administrators, like, oh my goodness, you're just asking for trouble. Uh, well, if you do this, then, you know, it's kind of like you're out on the limb by yourself. And I guess I felt very strongly that we should collaborate on this and that I knew that our faculty were not educated with this. It, they, Never know. been. You know, it wasn't their fault. No one had brought this. There had not been a dialogue. that type of dialogue with between the library and the faculty. Right. And so I did that, and instead, I think there were two people who wrote diatribes to the administration. But other than that, I had more letters and comments of how refreshing that we're talking about this, that you are alerting us to a problem instead of doing something to us. And it went off very smoothly without a hitch. Sure, it's not something you wanted to do, but it was done. done. Right. And when we did the second one, we did it the same way. Sure. Um, but in the meanwhile, I think that also helped uh, them have confidence in the library and as we continue to move forward uh, in always in communication with them as our next stages of, of uh, mm -hmm. automation and and particularly the teams moving rolling yeah together. particularly um, as we moved on to electronic databases and right. all like that. Students in the library, you had a lot of contact with the students, didn't you? Uh, different, different aspects. They'd Probably not as much as I would have liked to, but I always try to partake in one or two or three student events a year. I'd sort of pass it around, as I called it, as to which one tried to listen to them when they would at least come in and we were able for for instance changing hours and uh, trying to do what we could do by by listening sure. to them right um, I was also pleased that um, I was became a member of, of Iron Key that honorary uh, with students and I had a wonderful year 
occupy with students, even though I didn't feel like I'd go to the breakfast club with them when invited, and I, I did not go, but <laughs> but it was it was fun. <laughs> And we got things done now. It was it was really a serious sure. group. Oh yeah, right. Um, physical facilities. One of the things, of course, is the renovation of the Hissy Library. Mm -hmm. That was a big undertaking, um, including the Walter and Sarah owned Beyond Electronic Reference Center. Well, I guess about all I can can say is my vision was a big comprehensive library when I took the job. I remember standing with Dr. Beering in his office when he and I uh, were talking about the job. And we were both looking at the power plant site and we kind of both agreed that should be the spot for it. And um, center of campus, all like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I said, that was not going to happen with everything else that had to be done. The university did not have the type of support from the state, nor did it have at that time support from external funding to create that type of edifice. And um, so in the scheme of things, you say, well, what kind of facility can we have to at least change one of our facilities into a sort of model where the next person can the next dean or the dean after or when can start to move in terms of the facilities. And that's kind of how um, one of the reasons uh, HISI came up. It was uh, probably not as functional in a facilities manner as we would have liked it and right here in the center of campus. Um, and at the, the same time, um, Walter came forward and was asking, was saying that his wife really wanted a million dollars to go to the library. And what could the library do with that? And, and they were interested in a naming opportunity. Well, you just whipped out a plan for that library so fast that your head would spin. <laughs> and so with that, the idea was to use that as a focal point to get more money. And it worked. Yes. Right. The other thing that you did, that digital learning collaboratory, that was kind of a new for, the, for your multimedia projects. Mm -hmm. It was sort of new for the libraries and it's really caught on. Uh, yes, and I will say to you, I will give Cheryl, our uh, previous um, associate dean, all the credit for carrying that forward. But it matched, it was an answer to our continued plans to have a high digital presence of the library. It also was a culmination of work we had been trying to do for many, many years in terms of getting a different working relationship with the Computing Center. And I will have to say it was only when the new uh, head of ITAP, when all of that, when that position was changed and when he came in, that we really started to see uh, that what we wanted to do would work. Uh, there had been, I mean, sure, this is an archival tape, I will say, there had been no leadership. It was a crime what this computing center was. I mean, a total crime. And the fact that there was no understanding uh, by the university administration at that time 
or the certainly not the guy who ran the computing center on the difference between computing for the masses and data processing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what you see in that uh, digital center down there is something, is a place we could have been years before. As a matter of fact, we had tried that, but there was not a collaborative bone there. It was like, assign the space to the computing center and you all have nothing to do with it. And no, that was not acceptable because we needed programmatic activities that matched this future. And so I, I would say to you that was a culmination of an idea that had been there for a long time that we tried to work on, but we just had to have a change of leadership in really? key places. Yeah. Yeah. And also the uh, and also yeah, wait one more thing on that yeah. and also it matched an incoming a new president's goals too. Okay. He wanted to show something that worked with undergraduate student learning, and he did want a kind of showpiece. So we always were strategic, and that's what our strategic plan I think did for us. It allowed us to be ready for opportunities as they presented itself. And so I would say Cheryl did a fine job when that opportunity presented itself and it was like, I think it was probably the fastest completion of a, a project that you've seen. Mm -hmm. And so. Been successful. Yeah, and yeah. I, I'm. That's one I'm pleased about, yeah. too. And, of course, the Earhart Collection, the gift of Sally Chapman. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm very pleased now that at last right. the vision on the archives will be achieved. Right. And while everything is pulled out there, actually we had drawn the, we had drawn the stuff on the fourth floor in that location. That existed for years before. And... Ideally, if we had been able to renovate the whole Hissy Library, that was part of the Hissy Library, that archives. Um, what we needed uh, was someone who could devote themselves to archives and who had a training in that and could talk that talk. Right. And so I think when Sammy Morris came, then that started to lay the groundwork and then when we got the Earhart gift, uh, again, the national exposure, all of that created, I think, the impetus that, yes, now, this could be the next step because we were seeing the accomplishments of our goals in the digital world. We, had, we were seeing our future on the right track so we could start to turn to the past. As a matter of fact, if you think about how the Hissy Library looks now in the renovation, it is a retro look. Mm -hmm. It is a preparation for that turn. I've always been one that's like symbolism, and it's sort of a preparation for that turn now. This is the future, and now we're going to turn back. So I am pleased that all of those ideas that were there in the past are now going forward under the new dean. Right. One of the, uh, another upshot of that uh, uh, Earhart thing was the airport is a historic site because in that proposal that they oh, wrote, yes. that was a big plus and having brought everything together really added to that. And uh, yes, and our fruition. work with... Um, Don Petron? Yes, Professor uh, Petron. Right. Uh, and, and helping that, and I remember working with him for a long time one day when you were right. out for some right. reason, and um, just turning up loads of information that impressed them right. and got that designation. It was another 
feather in our cap. And actually, when you look at this, and again, if you want to talk strategies, and I'll say perhaps what I brought to the libraries, that sense of strategy and strategizing and seizing opportunities and perhaps packaging, I won't call it marketing now, packaging ideas so that they fit Purdue. When you think about um, Amelia Earhart was here and then we had the most um, in terms of graduates in the uh, space program. Oh, you have, I mean, that is oh, you want to call it. Right. And we put that to work for us. Right. And it's pretty well come right. full, full right. circle. Right. Now, let's, fundraising, that was a, that made change, that changed certainly both in the Bering and also in the Jeske administration. And the library was much about also Vision 21 and the campaign for Purdue. And you were involved very closely in fundraising. Uh, yes, in a fact. A lot not done much <laughs> years ago. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I don't think, unless you were a librarian, the head of the library at a private university, uh, fundraising was not uh, one of your skill sets. So um, it was, I was not unique in, in not having uh, that experience before coming here. And in fact, there was too often, I think, a thought that as a state-supported institution, we shouldn't be out asking private funds. The state should be funding us. And that was heard a lot around here. And I've, I actually heard that from potential prospective donors when I talked to them. Like, you know, why should you be asking me for money? That's what the state should be doing. So I think we had uh, sort of unique experiences. I was not here for the first campaign because that first campaign uh, resulted, well, not quite, but in the undergraduate library. That's a centennial? You're yeah, whenever. Centennial? It was before right. my time. Right. And but I was um, here and a part of this, or I wasn't at a part when it first began because I wasn't dean yet. But uh, I came in on it fairly early, and so that was my first experience it's, uh, at fundraising. And we didn't do perhaps as well as one would have hoped then. Uh, we didn't have the prospective donors. We didn't have a school. Uh, fundraising itself was new to the campus, and there was, I'll say, a lot of um, territorialism at that point. These are my graduates, and, and you can't talk to them. And so we were only able to talk to people who expressed an interest in the library. It was, I'll say, it was a, a very, one of the most difficult things was just getting us into the literature that went out to all. And our first successes were the ability to put libraries as a point to give on a university mailing. And I'm here to tell you most schools would not support that. Some did. Yeah. And it was only through that that we were able to get our donors. So I'm pleased to say in the next era the fundraising had changed. Uh, everyone had had far more experience than with fundraising. Right. 
so it was easier to do the fundraising, but I will admit people did not look to the libraries as a place to give money. And <clears throat> this is one of the, the challenges when you have an organization like our libraries. MIT and Purdue were the only ones, only large libraries, the only research libraries in the nation with the kind of organization or with, with that kind of decentralization um, where you could not look to a building on campus and say that's the library. So we were invisible. So you had a generations of people, of graduates, who came through here that the library is not in your mind because you never saw them. But people who studied in one, it was like, yeah, I went to somewhere to study, but it was not, I think, the concept of a library. Uh, the other, I think, the, the other thing that made it a challenge is Purdue was not liberal arts, and so there was not that sort of um, feeling on campus of the importance of the library. So these were Did part you, of the, the yeah. things built into the system right. that made it difficult. Wasn't your advisory committee a, a help to let you had appointed that you had, were they helping the fundraising too? Your, your the development advisory committee that you had. There's a sounding board, or one of the things that you did, Emily, which was nice, is that they, when they would come, you'd have different groups of the staff join them for dinner, and that, uh, having experienced it, having heard from colleagues, they really appreciated that because it gave them a chance to interact on both sides. Mm -hmm. It was a nice, t it was a nice uh, approach. I'll, I'll have to say that our advisory group, um, and I, I have myself to blame for this, if you want to pass any blame out, was not as well focused as it should be. For instance, it wasn't focused as whether there should be a fundraising group. Uh, versus an advisory on what. It was certainly not, there was an idea that we should have a library's friends group when I came in, because there was not one. And when I, and so I think the advisory group became a sort of mixed bag because of that. Uh, I did not do a library friends group uh, upon the advice of a number of my colleagues from other universities who said, oh, you don't have one? Oh, <laughs> thank you, don't try to do it then. Or you have to make sure you have this and this established, the groundwork. And, and I talked to some people around here, and in a small uh, community, again, um, and with two public library systems, with their own friends groups. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem that there needed to be a focus. So I step back to say that because when the advisory group did come into being, I think you kind of had a, a bit a bit of both. And yeah, I I I, I can just say I didn't really focus it, but I thought uh, these were supporters of the library, and none of them were super wealthy. They gave what they could. They were very, they gave quite nicely. Mm -hmm. um, the rankings of your ARL, mm -hmm. that's always been, and we've been a membership, you know, since 1956. Produce been a member since mm -hmm. that. 
And now the, the recent ones have changed the focus, and so we've moved up. Mm -hmm. Which well, well, for years, for years, those of us, the ARL directors, I was part of the group that tried to get change. And the Harvards, the Illinois, the Indianas, the, the, they had a group called like the Big Heads Group, which was the top 25. And they were topped by their collection size. And of course the rankings were heavily weighted towards, well, almost totally, to collection size, staff size. Well, you have a big collection, you need a large staff. Right there. And also to the money. Well, you had to have money for that. So, um, and most of these were universities that were established years ago with large private collections. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, kept that up. So, uh, we were all in this together, but the powerful members of the association did not want to change. So I don't know what hit them last year, but thank goodness at last it hit them. Because I had said all along, if you count what's important in the real world, we would be near the top. Yeah, right. And I'm pleased to say that that is correct. But we really haven't moved up. It's only because the criteria for the rankings have changed. Have changed right? If you go back to the way they were, we'd be in the same place. Yeah. Okay, okay. I think you addressed this a little bit first, but the role of the library in the 21st century, and you sort of, some of the things that you've done during your tenure, you make a comment. One of the things that you said is teaching people how to use these new tools will be one of the most significant functions for libraries in the future. And I still believe that, and it does hurt me to see that that's not happening uh, as much as the direction we've been on. So I think that's my, my comment okay. is that was a way, but it's also very difficult. Um, when we started looking at this, uh, I remember one conversation I had with one of our colleagues who said to me, I did not come into librarianship to teach. I left teaching because I didn't like it. But that had meaning to me. I, I was very pleased that was shared with me. And I looked at that carefully and I, I saw that. And I saw that while one-on-one -on -one was fine, there was not a large desi desire to do what I will call getting the efficiencies through group teaching or through the development of tools that would reside at the desktop uh, for people to help themselves. So I think there is, I, I still feel that is key as I, as I use some of the systems now and as I watch other people use them, uh, we manage to create great efficiencies by moving to the digital world for information. Uh, if I can tell you a story, when I was at uh, General Motors, and I'm trying to think, well, this was about the time that we were able to do online searching. It's that long ago, and I know you share with me those days of mediated searching. And I remember a report that I wrote for uh, the, the GM research labs at that time showing the value of online searching. Well, of course, one of the reasons I wrote the report is so we could get money to support that. But we used to do, my job was actually doing the work for the researcher or executive. And it wasn't unusual that I could spend one week on one question doing the research through all of the paper, as I called it. I remember um, even before then when I was at Chrysler Corporation, 
One of the searches I did was on gunpowder. And you could say this is 1960, um, eight. Why was I doing a search on gunpowder and stuff? Well, gunpowder was the propellant for the airbags. And this is the research. So they sent me all over to find everything there was about gunpowder, its properties, its uses. And I traced it back and ended up having to have some Chinese documents, of course, translated because that's where it goes mm -hmm. back to. Um, and when you think of the expense, hours and expense, and all through all the lot of information in the mining literature. Okay, this is what I used to do. So when I did this one report for um, GM, I averaged 32 hours on, on a lot of these searches. So what I did for this little bit of piece of research, I set up uh, a topic. I think we did five of them, just quick and dirty. Here's the topic. Dorothy, one of uh, my reference librarians, she used to do a whole lot of, she did all of the, uh, a lot of the, um, we called it manual searching at that time. So that's how I got the average of the 32 hours. And someone else over here who did most of the on the uh, literature searching through the dialogue did the same search. And it was uh, one hour. And we ended up with a very high, about 90%. Because we did do it, I did do a cutoff because you recall uh, the online did not go back that far. So we did match those, limited to those years. And so, of course, we had great coverage. And was able to say one hour versus 32 hours. Look at the time saving. Okay, now today, we all work in the one hour or less phase. But what has happened, because now there is so much uh, electronically, I'm not sure that that one hour, it it's, has increased. It's not as efficient. And this is where learning where to put your time and on what is valuable and how do you know, because uh, we know there's so much, it's mainly garbage out there, how do you know what is the reliable information? This we've got to do more of. The need is more critical than ever before. I agree. And it appears we're backing away from it, which is a problem, mm. in my personal opinion. Agreed. Right. One thing, I, well, you served on the Presidential Search Committee for um, the successor to Dr. Baring. Mm -hmm. Were you pleased to be on the committee? Oh. Was that your first one, that uh, Presidential yes. Search? Yes, <laughs> my first and only. Uh, it was fun. It, it, it really was. I enjoyed working with the Board of Trustees. I also enjoyed the frankness of the search committee. I mean, sure, it was, con it was confidential. Oh, yeah. And there was uh, much frankness. And so as we, you know, work through the candidates, one of the things I enjoyed doing, and I think I gave the people on that search committee an idea of a different type of information specialist, i.e. librarian. When we were researching some of the potential candidates, I was sort of surprised how well, again, if you've not been exposed to this, uh, into 
getting as much information as you can about a prospective candidate without spending a lot of time. This is the kind of work, I went back to my days in the corporate world uh, mm -hmm. where we were doing competitor intelligence and also at uh, General Motors Research Labs, I used to research uh, prospective consultants. Uh, GM prided itself on having world-renowned scientists who were their consultants. I always remember Ilya Prigion uh, from France, a um, Nobel, Nobel Prize winner, of course. Uh, he was a nice little sweetheart and to this day. God rest his soul, I remember him. But I used to do that kind of uh, work for them and also uh, prospective new high-level executives and all like that. So when we started, so when we were working on the presidential search, I, you know, there would be some questions that would come up and I'd say, oh, if I had a computer here, well, you know, this is the problem with not having a wired campus. At that point, we still, we didn't have uh, access in wherever we were working over there in the union. So I was lugging these, I put these books on a cart and lugged them over. <laughs> who's who's? Sources. Uh-huh. And while we were talking about them, just start past the look them up now. Everybody look up, look up. <laughs> and, and so it was like it got to be a joke. Uh, Emily, what do you have on this one? Emily, what do you have on that one? And I will admit that when we were down to particularly one candidate who was um, getting close there. And I said, you know, on these, we ought to run through some newspapers and stuff in their uh, own towns and some other stuff. We need to go out to, to more than the um, biographical stuff. And I did, and it was like turned up some interesting stuff. And then they said, can you teach so-and-so how to do that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> sure, sure. Right. And so I, you know, I did the work on uh, President Jiski too. You got a good, <laughs> good help on that committee. So um, when I said I enjoyed it, and I think out of that, there, there was a, a different opinion formed, I think, certainly on the part of the trustees on what librarians can do. And I think the library came away with great respect from them. And I can tell you that the support, financial support, from that time forward was outstanding. Good. Mm. Let's talk a little about your professional activities. Uh, you were the president of SLA before you came here, and you've been on a couple of boards, and mm -hmm. just share us a little bit with some of those well, affiliations. I don't, I don't know why, but I've always been active. I've always been interested in um, professional um, activities. Uh, I felt that I've learned more to help me do my job here through some of those activities, uh, particularly in uh, dealing with people. So yeah, I started out very early. Um, it was 1967 when I went to, was it 67 when I went to Chrysler? No, it was 1965, mercy time flies, when I uh, went to Chrysler Corporation. And about a year or two later, I was appointed um, to, I think it was the Resolutions Committee, the National, as chair. 
Is this of SLA? Of Special Libraries Association. Because the meeting was being held in Detroit. And the resolutions a committee basically did all the resolutions at the conference, the thank yous and all. That was our only work. So I had a very visible, um, so to speak, assignment right straight off. And then I helped with that conference, so I just plunged right into activities. Of course, the national president who appointed me was the um, head of the GM Research Labs mm -hmm. library at that time. So, you know, it was um, uh, he knew me, I guess, so sure. all, it all worked out. But that started it. And from there, I was asked to do, you know, another thing and all. Then I became um, active in the Michigan chapter of SLA and became its president. From there, I went on to run for the board of directors in the spot of chapter cabinet, chapter cabinet chair elect. It was the spot that, say, all of the cabinets sort of reported to, all the state and regional chapters reported to. And it's a, that's a national election, and I was elected. And from there, I immediately uh, was elected into president-elect. So nice. when I came to Purdue in 86, I was already, I was president-elect then. And those first couple years were pretty daunting because uh, you're away traveling a lot. And I think mm -hmm. I was more efficient then than I've ever been in my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so oh. I, I was uh, very, very active and from there to I was appointed um, the board of directors of the Association of Research Libraries. Um, I also did some work for different ALA divisions and ALA at the national level. I was, well, you know, this is not on a record, but I was asked to run for ACRL president. And at that time, I felt that it was not something I needed to do. You've been on the visiting committee at uh, MIT. Excuse me. Wait, pardon? Mm -hmm. We have about 15 minutes left. Oh, 15 minutes left. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, visiting committee of MIT, Carnegie Mellon, uh, also um, Clark Atlanta. University's library school. Okay. Let's, well, uh, and of course, the nice thing is you're the Ed Esther Ellis Distinguished Professor of Library Esther Science. Esther Ellis Norton. Right, Norton, Distinguished Professor of mm -hmm. Library Science. Very mm -hmm. nice. Ah, uh, yes, Esther, speaking of donors to the library, uh, she was um, really the first benefactor of the library and a strong benefactor of the undergraduate library, a benefactor of the university, really. And Esther was a Special Libraries Association. She had been president of the uh, Cincinnati mm -hmm. chapter and moved here in her retirement uh, years and got to know her and, um, you know, really, shall we say, really pleased to work she was glad to see another SLA person here. So when President Beering decided that she needed to be honored because she had given the university so much money, and he felt that the honor would be to create an endowed chair in her name, and he wanted me to hold it, I had said to him, mm, no, no, no. And I think that meant a lot to Esther, too. So I have felt very, if you want to call it, warm and fuzzy about um, this chair. And of course, it is the 
probably the highest honor that a faculty member in a university can have an endowed chair. So right. um, I'm pleased. I think of her from time to time every time I pass by Westminster mm -hmm. uh, Village. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we're in closing. How about an outstanding event in your life? You think of one or two or three? Any? Come to well, I think the one we were just talking about okay. <clears throat> okay. was, uh, to me, an outstanding event. Uh, that level, that honor. Right. Um, I can truly say to you, it has been, it has been fun here. Um, Any uh, questions that you'd like to ask that weren't asked or any closing remarks that you'd like to make? Well, Katie, I think you've gotten into parts of my brain that I didn't know existed anymore. You've done very well. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you know how it is. You'll think of something um, later. Okay. But, um, you know, all I can you say... you got a lot of good memories of Purdue. Uh, yes, yes. I, I, I have... Uh, very, very good memories. It was a, I can say to you, it was a lot of hard work. I accuse Purdue of these gray hairs because the women in my family do not gray this early in life. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, all, all in all, I mean, it, it's, um, if you had asked me when I was 15 years old, if I would be here, I could not have visualized that. Uh, but at 15, I knew I wanted to be a librarian. But that I would be... Where you got to be. Yeah, right. I, was, I knew I wanted to be a corporate librarian. I wanted to be a science librarian. Um, but, you know, to be here... Um, no, no, I, I just... Uh, very good. We want to thank you very much for this interview. We really appreciate that. And this concludes the interview with Emily Mobley, and we thank you. Thank you, thank Katie. You. My pleasure.